Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And I want to say thank you to Elizabeth for allowing us um, uh, and how much we appreciate the opportunity to be here and celebrate our 40th anniversary. Uh, my job is the sweet job. I just get to welcome you. So welcome, welcome. I also get to thank all the people who helped put this together. And um, mainly what I would like to do is thank all of the New York Network board members. So if you could just stand, Benny, Joan, Jack, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I have a special thank you to Marsha Goffin and Roger Sanjek, who gave up their time, and to Joan Davis, do you want to wave, and Jack Kupferman, uh, because many of you are here because of those particular people. Uh, I also want to tell you that there are Great Panther uh, pieces of information in the back. We, I put out, uh, this is old, <coughs> but it's our last one, uh, the March-April, um, uh, our spring network news. And this gives you an idea of the kinds of things, activities, and programs that the Great Panther does. Uh, <clears throat> and um, the pink flyers, like this, that you were probably given, that's the program of the day. And on um, some of them, they're, because we're very environmentally conscious, uh, some of them have membership uh, pieces on the back of them, membership forms. And you are more than welcome to fill them out today and hand them in. OK. Um, Again, as I said, my job is sweet and short. I thank you very, very much for coming. And uh, now I am going to continue on. And I am going to introduce my good friend, Florence Denmark. She will serve as the moderator, and then she will moderate the rest of the panel. Florence is an internationally recognized scholar, researcher, and public policy maker. She received her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in social psychology and has six, let me repeat, six honorary degrees. Um, she is the Robert Scott Pace Distinguished Research Professor of Psychology at Pace University in New York. She is a past president of the American Psychological Association and the International Council of Psychologists. She holds fellowship status in the APA and the Association for Psychological Science. She is also a fellow of the Society for Experimental Social Psychology and a fellow of the New York Academy of Sciences. She has received numerous national and international awards for her contributions to psychology. Florence's most significant research and extensive publications have emphasized women's leadership and leadership styles, the interaction of status and gender, aging women in cross-culture perspectives, and the history of women in psychology. She is the main representative uh, to the United Nations for the American Psychological Association and is currently um, with the International Council of Psychologists as their main representative. She's the immediate past chair of the NGO Committee on Aging and serves on the executive committee of the NGO Committee on Mental Health and on the Family. Florence is 78 years old. I am 67 years old. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Judy. I, you forgot to mention that I'm a member of the Grey Panthers also. So. <laughs> uh, and I, have, I also have a very nice job today, which is to introduce our distinguished panel members. And then part of it isn't so nice, because if they run overtime, I'm going to be the 
nasty timekeeper, but each one has uh, roughly 10 minutes to speak, and I don't think I'll be, have to be too uh, nasty on cutting people off. Uh, what I'm going to do is introduce each one, and then each as they speak, not, not all three at once, and then we'll save any questions and comments until the end, after all three have spoken. I do want to make mention that the idea for this program came from my husband, Robert Westner. And Bob was on the board in the New York group of Grey Panthers, and, and I didn't give him the idea. I mean, this came apparently from him. Uh, he was a strong feminist as well as an activist and a Grey Panther. And so I'm filling in, in that sense, I guess, for him as the moderator, because he, he did die last April. So, um, and, and one thing I will mention, for anyone interested, uh, on October 21st, which is a Thursday, at 4 o'clock, in the Church Center of the United Nations on the 10th floor, there will be a memorial for him. It won't be a religious memorial, but people will speak. And four to five on the 10th floor there and followed by refreshments. So I hope as many of you as are able to will feel free to come to that. All right, now for the business of the day, which is, uh, you know, something which is, uh, as I said, my honor to, to introduce. And I guess if going in order from the person next to me to my left will be Benny Price, oh, who's less than half my age, he's age 30, <laughs> 35. And Benny is a self-described jack of all trades administrator. She comes to us with 10 years of social service experience, ranging from working in St. Barnabas Nursing Home to project and survey management. Benny holds a BA in sociology from Fordham University and a master's of social work from Fordham's Graduate School of Social Services. Currently, Benny works at the Henry Luce Foundation where she strives to use all of her skills to support the company's mission of responsible philanthropy. Currently, as a board member of the Grey Panthers, she continues to advocate for the rights of seniors in New York City. That is your turn. Your turn. <laughs> Thank you, Florence. Um, I was asked to discuss why I joined the Grey Panthers. Um, my experience with the Grey Panthers began while I was attending graduate school. I was in my second year of field placement when Dr. Pat Brownell, who some of you are familiar with, um, asked me to attend one of the meetings. Out of curiosity, I agreed to attend. And I have to admit, I was a bit skeptical. Um, when I first thought Grey Panthers, I'm thinking, okay, this is another advocacy group. What more could they possibly have to talk about? What would set them apart from other advocacy groups throughout New York City? And I said, okay, I'll go and I'll find out. I discovered that the Grey Panthers are who they say they are. They're an advocacy group who fights for the rights of seniors throughout New York City. And here we are at our 40th anniversary and we've tackled issues ranging from housing to environmental to aging in place. We've maintained our presence within the community, whether it's through tree planting in New York City, through e-recycling, or rallying against the closing of Peter Place in Manhattan. Um, we've also added our voices to rally against New York City budget cuts, as well as the war in Iraq. Wow, my speech is actually faster than I thought. <laughs> Going forward, I would like for us to continue to be an active voice throughout New York City, but we can't do that unless we get more younger members. Um, recently, we've lost a few key members to our organization who were able to add their experience and expertise to the Great Panther mission. And now, I believe my purpose is to stress to the younger members to join 
and to lend their voices um, to us as well. So thank you. <laughs> well, it was short and, yes. and but sweet and very important. So I certainly don't have to use a hook and go no. for you off the stage. <laughs> so do I, I do I get her the rest of her time? Yes. <laughs> Uh, let me also mention, I see a few people standing. There are some seats up here, so please feel free to fill in. Okay, well, the next speaker is Maria Alvarez. And, and her age is 46. Maria Alvarez is the deputy director of New York Statewide Senior Action Council, a community-based membership organization made up of individual senior citizens and senior citizen clubs from all parts of New York State who advocate for their interests and needs regarding services, programs, and policies affecting older persons. Maria has worked over 22 years with communities across New York State, designing and implementing educational, social service, and leadership programs for seniors and youth, and is committed to the advocacy and empowerment of these populations. During this time, Maria has worked with senior citizens groups as an organizer, advocate, and director of housing and caregivers programs throughout the metropolitan area of New York. She holds a bachelor's degree from Marquette University and a master's degree in nonprofit management from the New School for Social Research, where she was a Sloan Fellow. Maria? Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Judy, for inviting me to, to speak here today. Um, this is a wonderful, oh yeah. <laughs> I, um, this is a great, a great, uh, it's a great honor to be here um, among so many people and to, to uh, so many you know, important people and, and people who've actually made a difference in in the senior movement, and not only the uh, senior uh, movement, but the whole social services movement. Um, you know, I read the uh, Ro uh, Roger Sanjek's book uh, on on the development and the and the on Maggie Kuhn and the and the uh, founding of the Great Panthers, and it was interesting because it was first of all it's a very well written uh, book, and it documents precisely how you know the minds the mind frame of of the time and how it was uh, it came about and all of the different strategies that they that they took to um, you know to, to make change and what struck me was that the more I, I read and I about you know 30 40 years ago the things that were going on, First of all, I remembered a lot of it because we were working, all of us were working in this, but also it's exactly what's happening today. It's a parallel. It's, I mean, we could just take the times, uh, um, put the, uh, change the dates, change some of the players, and we would still have uh, a lot of the same issues that we have today, which means that we have our work cut out for us, you know, as uh, seniors and you know, as, as you were saying, Benny, that um, we need the younger people as well. Um, first of all, I think it's really appropriate that today is the International Grandparents Day. So for all of you who are grandparents, um, congratulations. And, um, but it should also be a, um, you know, an opportunity to speak to your grandchildren about the importance of, of the senior movement and what hap what's going to happen for them you know so that they could start thinking about it i know people in my my age group even don't think about retirement and they should be at, at this point or what they're going to be doing when they retire so um and a lot of the policies that are going into effect today don't really affect the seniors for today i mean some of the immediate ones do but things like social security what they want to do with social security 
um, the Older Americans Act, those are, are all policies that are going to affect the baby boomers and generations to come. So, um, you know, we're in a very challenging and interesting time right now for, for the senior movement because we have a crop of baby boomers that are coming, that are aging in, who seem to be um, sort of oblivious <laughs> to what it actually means when you need to get your Part D, you know, when you need to collect your Social Security. They seem very entitled. They think that things are gonna happen just the same way. Their lives are not gonna change. It's just that they're, they may go into retirement if they feel like it or if, um, or they can also get a second job if they want to, or, and, but now we see that a lot of people need it. And when they start signing up for all of these, these uh, you know, for Part D, for example, and I know because I speak to a lot of them on the, on the hotline that we run, um, they don't understand why is it that they have a certain choice, they have to make choices between, you know, their plans. And in New York State, we have 35 different plans that they have to, you know, uh, choose from. And, and uh, it can be confusing even for a professional. I can't imagine what, what it, you know, somebody just walking into the system cold. So, um, you know, and then just, so the, these are just things that we need to, to let people know about because while they, are, they might be a little bit more vital right now, they, have, they might have certain means, they might have certain sophistication that seniors when in Maggie Kuhn's time, you know, 40 years ago, were, did not have. They do not have the history. They do not have the activism, uh, the, the activism bone in their body because they don't remember. A lot of them just don't remember. So um, I think it is up to us as seniors, the whole senior network, to go and educate and become peers with these baby boomers and the younger generation so that this doesn't happen again. And because it's just a shame to see all of the, the, um, the, uh, the strides that we've made for the last 30, 40 years um, go backwards and we'll lose it if we don't do it. Um, and it also strikes me that, that the Great Panthers is, was, you know, it was 40 years, um, 40 years old, and it's a national organization, and it's not just about senior services and senior policies. I mean, the, 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 uh, the Great Panthers is a wonderful organization because it stands for senior citizens who do not see their age as limiting, you know. Senior, um, the, the, the members of the Great Panthers care about being green. You know, I, I know that last year they, uh, the, the New York City chapter of the Great Panthers had this whole uh, symposium. It lasted for I don't know how many, like months, three months. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, the thing is that a lot of the, green Pan uh, the Great Panthers uh, members are members of statewide as well. So I heard this. Uh, all about the uh, Grey Panthers and you know going green and finally I had to go and find out what it was because they were talking about it so much and it's wonderful they had experts from all over the world coming and speaking on these important issues um, they adopted policies um, they have policies on the on the different wars they have the granny brigades they have you know this is not an organization that is just saying okay we're you know first of all you know they're definitely not laying down and dying here, number one. Number, number two. I hope not. <laughs> number two, they, consider, they still consider themselves a vital part of society, which is important because we need people who have experience to be able, and the history to be able to speak to people today. We can't let that history go, you know, adulterated or lost. We have to know what it is. You know, with all of these things happening in the economic crisis, um, I've had some very good and in, in interesting conversations with people, with seniors, saying, you know, the recession is bad, but I went through this when I was younger, you know, or my father, or, you know, so that kind of perspective you cannot buy. I mean, <laughs> you need to have somebody who is able to, to steer us through that, and it would be members of, of the Great Panthers and of the other senior um, organizations um, the other th so they have a whole host the green the, the great green panthers you should change it to green panthers <laughs> uh, the great panthers um, 
you know, they care about a whole host of, of, um, of, uh, of issues from health to, you know, social justice, economic justice. And they're always a vital part of any type of campaign that we take on. Again, like I said, in statewide and in Brooklyn-wide, which I also, I also direct, um, we, have, uh, we have a lot of campaigns that we're part of, and the Great Panthers are always front and center with whatever it is that we're going to do. They contribute their manpower, their, their, uh, their creativity, <laughs> and um, their great ideas. Uh, so it, it's a wonderful organization, and um, I would also venture to say that, given I mean, just looking at the the the, uh, the history, you know, the um, the uh, chronology. If the Great Panthers are 40, statewide is 38, and Brooklyn wide is about 35 years old. So this was all part of a movement, but. You know, and, and what we see is that the Great Panthers, which is on a federal level, you know, it's, it's a national level. It's not just one organization that came out, you know, from California and just stayed there. This was an organization that grew and that people, and it's very well recognized. It's gotten to the point where people recognize it and, um, and want to become members. It's something that you want to be a member of, and it's, it's something that uh, people say, oh, you know, the Great Panthers is something sort of like you, you the image that you get are these rabid seniors that are not going <laughs> to lie down and take it anymore. But um, the other thing I was going to say is that uh, because it's a, the, or, the organization's members consider themselves still part of society, they also make these enormous contributions on, you know, in dictating what will happen in, you know, in society and um, for, for the social services um, you know, to come. Uh, right now, the, um, the United States is an aging uh, nation. New York State especially is aging. In, by the year, I think it's 2020, New York City will have more seniors than children. Um, if you think about it, seniors compose two thirds of the electorate of New York State. There is no reason for us to have Social Security being cut or put into a trust fund. There is no reason to have HMOs and insurers making a great deal of amount of money off of the, you know, the, well, the wellness of seniors. It's a, it's a voice that should be heard loud and clear. There should be no government that would even dare to touch a senior budget. In fact, they should be enhancing it just because of the fact that we um, that we're a growing population, um, and I know we I probably have to close. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> One more thing I just wanted to say um, at, at statewide we we became the um, the lead agency for the Elder Economic Index in New York State, and um, what we have found is what what we did was we uh, took each county and we calculated the average amount of money that it would cost for a senior to retire in that county. Obviously, it's not a perfect tool, but it's a very good tool to begin with. And what we have found is that, you know, a lot of these programs and benefits get, um, get calculated, you know, for, for seniors to receive them according to the federal poverty level. Well, the federal poverty level in New York, in, in the United States last year, this year, is $10,800. Now, here we are living in New York City, you know, where are you going to find anybody who could live on $10,800? So, um, and what we have found that in, in Brooklyn, it costs about $26,000 to live on an average for a senior, for a single rent, you know, renter, one bedroom. Um, and about 27 in New York City, or 25, but it's in that ballpark. So if we do not have a lot of the programs and subsidies that, that we, we have that are constantly being you know, threatened, I mean, every time there's a, there's a budget cut or a budget deficit reduction program, who do they affect? Who gets affected? The social services, you know. Um, anyway, if we don't, if we don't work, to make sure that those, 
things don't happen, seniors are not going to be able to live in their communities. Um, and it's, it's a shame, you know, it's a shame because the communities were bu built by the seniors. You know, this is, if we're anywhere here, it's because everybody here has worked hard enough to, to, to make sure that these, these, uh, these benefits, these programs, these communities exist. Um, and um, the other thing is that Brooklyn Wide actually held one of the only older Americans re, uh, reauthorization events in, in New York. Um, you know, why more organizations didn't take that on, you know, it's a mystery. But those, those programs within the Older Americans Act are, first of all, there's things that Maggie Kuhn and the Grey Panthers worked hard to get past when, when this happened. That's number one. Number two, right now, they, those are all the community services, the nutrition, the senior centers, and all of those things in transportation. Those things are all being are all under attack. These are the first things that should be enhanced for a better life for seniors, and so I think that um, with uh, with all of that said, I mean I can go on forever, so I won't. But <laughs> I wanted to invite everybody to come to the New York Statewide Senior Action Council meetings. The, the next one is tomorrow. If anybody is interested, just let me know, and I'll I'll tell you where it is. And Brooklyn-wide Interagency Council on Aging meets at Borough Hall the, um, the third Wednesday of every month. And anybody who wants information, I could tell them afterwards. But thank you so much for having me. Before introducing our third speaker, uh, let me mention that, uh, as you can see, Although, like the Grey Panthers may do a lot of work for seniors, as the title of this program, well, the, the program is, deals with, says women, but I'm just getting at the part, linking generations of women. Perhaps we could have added women and men because women and men are welcome to be part of the Grey Panthers movement, to attend these events, and the ages, any age. We may work for seniors, but we remember linking generations means that younger people as well are, not, are invited to be active because everyone at some point will become a senior. So you're only, the younger people are working for your own future as well as, as the current, working for current seniors. All right, let me uh, now introduce what for me, it's like a piece de resistance to introduce Lillian Sarno, who is 101, something we can all aspire to. Lillian Sarno's expertise in pushing for women's rights extends over many decades. Rather than follow the rules and limitations set for her because she was a woman, she set new rules. Mrs. Sarno graduated with a degree in law from New York University. She worked as a lawyer for 10 years. While rearing her family in New York, her activities included raising funds for Hadassah's Youth Aliyah to relocate desperate children to Israel. In the early 1960s, she and her family moved to Long Beach. The community was agitating for a mental health clinic. Mrs. Sarno joined in their efforts to get legislation passed. And then she helped raise the money so that the Long Beach Mental Health Association could open a clinic. Not a stay-at-home mom, Mrs. Sarno began studying for a second career. Following her graduation from Adelphi University with a master's in social work, she worked for three years at Creedmoor Hospital and then 13 years in its aftercare clinic where she became its administrator. Mrs. Sarno is not a one-issue person. Her leadership includes Grey Panther convener, demonstrator, spokesperson, and personal tutor to new members, and is featured in Roger Sanjek's 2009 book, 
Gray Panthers. Thank you. Now that you know all about me, I don't have to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have a lot to say. I, I was an advocator from my early years. In 1916, I was giving speeches for the Liberty Bonds. Most of you don't even remember, you don't even know about that. <laughs> and and that, that was the beginning of my, my, my speaking career. <laughs> but it's getting to the Great Panthers, when I retired in 1966, I decided that there were two things I was going to do in my retirement. One thing was travel, and the second thing was join some organization which would help other people. So I, I never felt that I was alone in the universe. I, there were always people who needed help. And today they need it more than ever. And we're finally realizing that we're 50% people in poverty. We've got to do something about that. We always said we had to do something about it. And we do little pieces here and there, but we don't really help. And I hope now that we're in this very fractious Congress, they'll get down to do something about it. Because it isn't their fault that they're poor. It's our fault. We just have so much riches in this country, and that we don't share it is very unfair. And, and, and I'm sure we don't, when we meet somebody who's poor, or we learn about somebody who's poor, we do try to help individually, but that's not enough. We've got to do something in, together that will raise people from poverty. 795 is not enough to live on. You need more money than that. The other thing is that when I joined the Great Panthers, the thing that they were working on was a single payer. Hello, we're still working on a single payer. I, I, think, I think Obama, it's a tragedy that he introduced this health bill and got it passed because it's, it's gonna be very difficult. We were, people are going to have to pay the subsidies, people who can't afford the insurance, and it, it really isn't suitable. Single payer is much better with, than all these false stories about the Canadians who come to the to, um, United States to get health treatment are phony stories. Don't believe them. Every once in a while somebody will come, but most of Canadians are very happy with their system. And I was amazed to find out that a friend of mine who had a child with measles was surprised one Sunday when the doctor came to the house to see if the child was all right. I, no doctor has come to my house since I was five years old. <laughs> But, but I think that what Franklin D. Roosevelt did was wonderful. I'm very grateful for Social Security. I'm very grateful for the state of New York for the pension that they give me. But neither of the two would be enough to, 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 to support me. So you, all the people that lost their um, money in the 401ks have my sympathy. It was a good idea, but it didn't work out. And that's what this health bill will be, a good idea that won't work out. As far as the great faces are concerned, I don't know how much is in the book, because by the time 
He got finished writing the book. I couldn't read it anymore. <laughs> so I had to, I had to be satisfied with the pictures of it a minute. And now I can't see them either. But I think that Maggie Kuhn had an, uh, the, the basis of an idea for an organization which would be different from other organizations. She, she worked for 20 years in the Presbyterian Church as a social worker, and she knew all about those kind of organizations, and she didn't like them. She tried to make a better organization, and we're still trying to make it a better organization. We, we work with all kinds of organizations, the housing organizations, social work organizations, any, any, any organization ready to help people and work with people gets the sympathy and the, and the assistance of the Great Panthers. The Committee on Aging of the United Nations, which was, is, it, is it part of this meeting, was founded by Maggie Kuhn when she was part of the, our, our or, or representative to the United Nations. So we've had recognition far and wide. And we will continue working on the same level and, and we hope to have similar success. There's a story about Maggie Kuhn that when they told her that she had to retire from the Presbyterian Church because she was 65, she got very annoyed and, and refused, first she refused to retire, but they had her, you know, on the rule, so she had to retire. When she retired, there were about four or five other women who had retired, had to retire at the same time. And that, at that time, they were working in Philadelphia. So they got, these, these women got together, and they went to Congress every once a week from Philadelphia to speak to congressmen about mandatory retirement. And the congressmen were willing to listen, and eventually they passed a bill against mandatory retirement. So there is no such thing anymore as mandatory retirement. They can't say 65 and you're out. Some of us can last longer than 65. <laughs> <laughs> so she, that, that was, a, when, when they got the bill passed, there was a suggestion that they should drop everything. And she said no, there were other problems that they as social workers knew about it, they should get together and work on them. So they did. But they didn't have a, didn't have a title, and they, they, they called themselves Old and Young for Social Justice. But one day, Maggie was talking on the, the um, television. She was being interviewed, and she was telling the um, interviewee interviewer, how she, how the, 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 her, her, her organization was working on this, this thing, that thing, the other thing, with uh, other organizations were also working on, and they were working together. And he said, you sound to me like Black Panthers. Well, they weren't black, they couldn't be Black Panthers. But she liked that name, and she liked the, what the great, what the Black Panthers were doing until they got militant. So she said, they, they, they called themselves the Grey Panthers. But the, the symbol Grey made lots of people think, oh, I can't join, I'm too young. Nobody's too young. <laughs> Nobody. Anybody can help other people. And everybody should do it. No matter how little you can do, no matter how much you can do, every little bit helps. 
There's nothing ever said that was truer than that. It's important. And I, I worked with the great painters for 30 years through all sorts of aggregations and, and d different ways that we had of maneuvering to make sure that we could be able to do what we wanted to do. And we had a, a, a member of Congress who every year put in a single payer bill. And when he retired, he had a hundred sponsors, which is quite a bit. And I don't know what happened to that. I don't know why that was ignored when Obama put, when Obama put in his bill. I'm, I'm glad he's there. I think he's, he's going to be progressive, and we need progression because the world is in a desperate, desperate strait. Very, very dangerous world and scary. But we have to do the best we can to see that we, we keep our, our eye on the ball and don't let these little uh, strange people <laughs> want, want to bury uh, Bibles and things like that. Burn books. <laughs> Don't them make a justice. That's why I, I, I'm in favor of letting that uh, Iman, is that what they call him, Iman? To um, have his, 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 his why. <laughs> at, at um, Ground Zero. Ground Zero is going to be a tourist trap. And as long as that's what's going to be, they're not keeping that out. So as long as they don't keep that out, I, I don't think they have a right to keep anything out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're an inspiration to all of us. Uh, we have a lot of time left, and there may be people out there who have comments, questions. Uh, I would also like to, at some point, ask Judy Lear and others in the in New York area to tell about activities that are going to be ongoing. But there may be somebody who has a question to anyone on the panel. Jack? discussion about the fact that this, this is a unique thing and it won't last. But even if they do live, they do live long lives, there are many ways to live life and everybody picks their own. If we continue having everybody taking drugs or everybody smoking, we're not going to, or everybody obese, we're going to have problems anyway. The young people are going to have problems anyway, and they're going to have to get together to figure out how to help themselves. Every, every, every um, generation does it in their own way. The way of my generation was militant. The 60s was a very wild age. 
and the introduction of drugs caused it to be even more difficult. But I think I think that's kind of waning now. I hope so. And uh, and, and people, will, young people, will pick up and and find their own way. Nobody can tell them how to do it. I found that out. <laughs> you can't tell a young person how to do it. You have to let them do it their own way. Give them assistance when, when they will take it. But they do it their own way. We did it our own way, they'll do it their own way. You can't make them do it your way. Okay, do you want to answer that or just then you? Oh, okay. Um, well, I think that's very wise what you just said. <laughs> it's true. Um, I, I think that a lot of it has to be do with education, with educating um, the public. I see a lot of these campaigns, um, you know, on TV that talk about drugs and all of that. So you're right. You know, a lot of the, the, the I mean, that's the way people interact. But um, you know, it's interesting. I was I was look I was saw an ad yesterday about the flu, and they were targeting targeting it to young people who are not as prone to get you know the, the flu. And they're saying, oh, you know, you should get vaccinated and all that. I was thinking, why are they not targeting this to to seniors? You know, <laughs> this is um, so. I think better education programs. Um, and I think, speaking from a programmatic perspective, intergenerational programs. Um, right now, for example, um, there are some statistics that came out on health, chronic you know, health issues. And Brooklyn, and especially in Bed-Stuy, they have the worst numbers, in, and sometimes in the nation, sometimes all, of, all of, New, of, of New York State, in terms of um, diabetes, obesity, you know, asthma, things like that. But then when we look at that, okay, and we see um, there was also an article about the, um, the, how in Bedford-Stuyvesant in East New York, they had the worst numbers for prenatal deaths. The mother would die, you know, the mo mother-to-be would die. And a lot of it had to do with their nutrition, with lack of insurance, and just a lot, and also they had some things where they even died because they were killed, because of family stress, I guess, and they were killed. But um, then you start thinking, if this is how the children are, are being raised, you know, with such horrible, you know, um, illness, you know, and conditions, no wonder why in their older age, you know, as seniors, they will have bad numbers as well. So if it's something that we improve from the beginning and we just bring it up, you know, from the, from the ch children's stages all the way up, maybe by the time that they become seniors and or younger adults, they'll be able to have a better situation. So I'm thinking that that's probably the best way to do it also for these kinds of issues. You know, if we could have some type of educational intergenerational program where the seniors that are living things now could communicate, um, you know, what's going on and how to improve what has happened and where things can go and how to improve it. It would probably make, at least create more sensitivity for younger generations um, so that when they become of retirement age, things won't look like this. Because they'll, they'll be able to take it into their own um, work, professional, you know, they'll be able to work, if they work in government, they'll, they'll, they'll remember this. Um, and um, so, yeah, so I just think that that, that would probably be a, an intergenerational approach would be necessary. Good, thank you. Benny, do you want to add anything? Yes. Um, I think the best way you can get a younger person involved would be pretty much on the same track how I have became a Grey Panther. Um, you have a lot of social work um, you know, programs out there, universities and programs where they have younger people working there, but maybe there's not the encouragement that you should, you know, join a program just like, you know, the Great Panthers or be interested in activities outside of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, you 
you may be a, a case, you know, a caseworker in, say, a social, a, a nursing home, but then you limit it to that. Once you leave that, you decide, okay, I'm going to go out and do whatever, you know, I have with my regular life. But I think once you, once you say to them, okay, once you actually get them out there to to see that it don't just it doesn't just affect what happens within their circle, but also in a broad sense then maybe you know, they'll become more active within the senior community. Also, um, we're thinking more on the lines of, of what we've talked about previously in other meetings where, where as most younger people don't get involved unless something immediate happens to them and their family. So whenever you have, say, your grandparent who is going through some kind of health, health issue, whether it's you know heart Ill, heart failure, heart illness, then once they see what happens within certain areas, then they can say, okay, we need to advocate, and then they get the more what is the word I'm looking for the not the um, <laughs> you know to go out there and say okay yeah the motivation thank you to go out and say okay. You know what? We need to be more active. We need that. So basically, what you, I think is just to get to light the fire under the younger generation, mm -hmm. the younger people, and say, okay, look, this is what's happening now. You will experience this, whether you think you may or not. Mm -hmm. You know, this is it. This is what you have to focus on. And can I just add sure. something to it? Another thing is that when we look at the schools. Um, for example, medical schools, there nobody is encouraged to go into gerontology. You know, even though it's going to be the largest population, no one is saying, you know, because it doesn't pay, so people are more attracted to going into other specialties. But there has to be something that, an incentive for people to want to, other than, you know, the human part that you were talking about, mm -hmm. for people to, uh, to become doctors specializing in gerontology social workers that are studying social work they they don't they don't like to to come you know they they think it's better to go deal with seniors i mean with children with education or they're going to go into private practice but you don't see a lot of uh people that are going to specialize in in uh, gerontal in social work for for seniors and um i think that's a big mistake because you know and then i mean if you look at it from a social perspective it's, you know, we see the media, everything goes toward youth and, you know, the baby boomers, they, want, they, they don't want to become old, they want to become young, you know, all of that. I think all of that, that whole mind, mind frame and that mindset that we have in this country mm -hmm. does, you know, negates the, anything having to do with a senior, and that's something that we should have to change. Florence, can you also answer the question? <laughs> you would have a great insight, given that you're a professor at Bates. Well, one thing that, that I don't know how much insight I know. I've just personally, I've always been an activist, and I fight for all kinds of people, whatever, regardless of age or anything. But one thing I did find, I I co-teach a class that's called multicultural and gender issues, and my colleague and I really teach it as a course in diversity. Now at Pace, the the, the doctoral program is school clinical child. So these are people who start out interested in children. But I bring in a speaker who's a colleague who is a gero psychologist. She works in a nursing homes and, and, and I'm telling you, having her, this, it, it opened my eyes because I thought, I wonder how the class will respond to her. And she, talk to them, he had, you know, it was a, really a very nice answer to their questions. And at the end, I had students who say, we want to work with this population. Can we write our term paper on this and can we get involved? So I think my point here is that just uh, telling younger people about a, a different age group than they think they're interested in gets them interested and they and they really did become involved and eager to go out and visit her in their nursing home and and continue their interest there so that I was really happy with that and I think that is one way is to you know let people know what's going on with older people and that is it's exciting and interesting to work with them 
Yes. I'm just wondering uh, if you have any thoughts on reaching out to people, young people, uh, who are not in the university, who are not being hired, involved in higher education. What suggestions would you have to reach to the grassroots, the, the bottom line, the, the, the have not, so to speak? How can you, do you have any ideas how to reach such people? Mm -hmm. Or the art of, I'll go even further, because I think it sounds like it's just geared to the city of New York, but the redneck population, for example. <laughs> and there are lots of rednecks in, in New York City, not just in the South. <laughs> the rabid people, the, the really rabid people that what I was hearing, for example, yesterday at Ground Zero, uh, following the memorial, there was a major demonstration regarding the, the mosque. And I'm hearing more now that it's not a mosque per se for worship, it is to that be meant for education. So, you know, what is it all about? But there are people who are really raving about this, this issue. But just to restate my question, how to reach out beyond the university walls or the college walls? Well, I turn it over to the, anyone on the panel who wants to answer that. Did you? Or mm -hmm. all of you? Yeah, the question is how do you get people who are not in college or never going to go to college, younger people, and including rednecks? To get involved, how do you, how do you, can we do something with that group? It's not easy, I'm just saying, because you have to, you have to move into their circles. You can't expect them to come to you. You have to be with them where they are, and where they are is usually not very pleasant. So people, it's hard to get people to go there. But I know we tried several times to, uh, in the Great Panthers, we tried several times to uh, move into the, the projects. And it was very difficult. I, I, I went many times to different projects to speak to them about joining the Great Panthers and, you know, moving out into circles where you could help other people. And they all feel they need the help. They don't, they don't want to help other people. They, th they feel they need the help more than anybody and they don't get it. So it's a very difficult thing to do. Yes. Um, I have, I've worked um, with programs, you know, throughout my career, and a lot of it has been with, with uh, multicultural projects and underserved populations, and especially um, populations that have been marginated. Um, and what we found is, um, you know, usually if you have people that are representative of that community that can come and speak to them about what, thing, what is going on, they assimilate better and then and that's just the initial thing because then once you start you know a process of getting people you know more involved in the in the the movement that's going on then all of those other barriers start going down you know um but i feel that it's it's very important to begin to you know to begin with people who are representative of that community who can better communicate with them, you know, until then a process of acculturation occurs. I think that was part of the success of ACORN in the beginning. Right. Mm -hmm. Because um, that's what ACORN did. Okay. Um, yeah. Now go, if you, no, I mean. I, I'm just a panel. Did you want to comment on that? No. No, okay. Clarence and then gentleman in the I back. I think we need to take, <clears throat> get some, uh, Price from the people who market products in this country. Hmm. Having worked with the Ad Council for many years, I knew when we were focusing in on children and youth, we would have focus groups of children and youth at all levels of society and find out what their interests are and uh, how do you reach them uh, with a message. And I think we have.
be more of that for the Panthers uh, and this whole aging group. That's a good, good point. Yes, did you want to? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ed Shaw. Uh, I'm perhaps the newest member of the Great Panthers here in New York. And uh, the UN uh, representative as well, with Judy and several others of us here. I'm also the chairperson of the New York Association on HIV over 50. And uh, it's somewhat fortuitous that uh, we speak about different approaches that we need to, to uh, use to get uh, younger persons involved. Over the past several years, uh, I've been making an effort to, to demonstrate with uh, service providers and senior centers and churches that we need to reach families through an intergenerational program. And uh, I've been doing that now for several years, uh, specifically around HIV AIDS and a number of other health issues that impacts the aging process. Uh, and you talked about the uh, gerontologist. Uh, just uh, last month, uh, I presented at Mount Sinai Hospital to a group of uh, gerontologists. And uh, as a member of the Health and Hospitals Corporation's uh, advisory board, I've uh, also uh, asked and recommended that they institute gerontology programs throughout the HHC facilities, and that they have done. So it's a good okay. thing. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to bring to mind, we're having a meeting on this Tuesday, and uh, we're highlighting the international, or the national, rather, excuse me, the National Day of Aging, which is on September 18th, but my meeting is on Tuesday, and we're celebrating that with a host of uh, service representatives and myself, and we'll be talking to the talking to the issue of uh, aging uh, updates. So certainly feel free to uh, join in that activity. It's at GMHC. I have flyers. If you can't go, please encourage some of your neighbors, your friends, your cousins. It's really important that we all get involved in this process. And uh, with Judy uh, uh, inviting me to become a member, I, I took on the task of doing that because I wanted to get involved more with social social justice and education and health care issues. And we need to do it all as a family, not uh, not divisively, but collectively. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Yes. Uh, in regard to her question, there are many organizations out there in this city, some I've worked with, like West Side Alliance, the Fulton Housing Group, the Hudson Guild, that uh, intergenerational, and they're working on problems, social issues of the city, the people, poverty issues, etc. The old-fashioned settlement houses are still alive and well in New York City, and they are a training ground to bring these people out and prepare them to work for the issues. So there are groups reaching out other than just to the higher education groups. Mm -hmm. And they're doing some fantastic work in the city and not getting credit for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, yes, sir. sir. Uh, to add to that, I'd like to say that the uh, intergenerational programs uh, were severely slashed in this city just recently. Yep. to the City Department for the Aging. And if you examine those programs, which were piloted or initiated there, you'd find many of them commendable. I think that's regrettable. We concentrated on the center issue, you know, and we ignored the fact that, that there are other elements of the social uh, necessity. You know, the, the thing that I thought, just this morning I thought of it again, you know, there were several pro two programs on, that I saw on TV this morning in which there were gross ac inaccuracies given concerning the social issues facing this country. And both of these programs amounted to elected officials who were, who were mouthing information which is totally false. I know it's false because I happen to be in a position to be more informed. But we, we need to have a cadre of people you know, to tell the truth first of all, of what the social issues are that are needed in this community. And also when it comes to intergenerational issues, 
as was just mentioned earlier, there are multiple activities going on in this community which are, are, are expensive in terms of, of human investment in them, which in, have, have turned around the attitude and behavior of neighborhoods and members so that they realize that we have a responsibility to each other. And that should be nurtured and it should be funded, you know. And I think that if the if great councils were to do anything that would be meaningful, it would be to come up with a, a, a new kind of advocacy that, that tells the truth about the viability and the need of things like Social Security and the Medicare and, and, and other programs which were initiated for very good reasons and need to be nurtured and continued and not beaten to death, and they are broke. Mm -hmm. yeah. awesome. Thank you, yeah. Money always is a problem, but I, I think the, you, but to be an advocate, you, you don't need the money to advocate and get put, go out there and on the front lines and fight for things that we all would believe in. But it's hard work. Oh yeah. No, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just, it is work, but are there any other? Um, oh, okay, didn't see you. of older people 
were awash in money. Uh, and we never did realize um, the peace uh, dividend, is, that's what it was called. But how in times of economic scarcity do we work together in coalitions and in age groups and are needy in all of this when most of the children in our country or many children are in poverty. And at the other end of the spectrum, many aged are in poverty. And in between, you have working families struggling to maintain shelter and food and education. How do we work together to prevent the powers that be the decision makers from pitching one group against another. Welfare mothers versus the aged, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's where we have to, especially in times of scarcity and economic difficulty. That's a very good question. Before I turn to the panel who may want to respond, uh, let me thank you and Roger for what you did for the disabled. Anyone? Yeah. And anybody here want to take sure. a chance? Oh, sure. Do you want to respond? Yeah. Well, the question is how can we basically, with so many people in need, from young children to the aged and anybody in between, how do we keep groups from or how, not the groups themselves, but how do we keep government or things from pitting one group against another? It's the elected officials. Yes, the elected sure. officials. Um, well, one thing that you, one thing you said that was very true is that when times were good about 10 years ago, we had a surplus in New York State. We had a surplus in the nation. They were still cutting us. You know, I could show you that, you know, we were still, you know, cutting Medicaid, Social Security. We were still fighting all of those things. So now when things are seemingly bad, they, you know, then they say, well, it's the economy. One of the things that, um, first of all, yeah, one of the things when, we, when we're confronted with that and we do advocate, you know, with our elected officials and throughout campaigns, you know, it just doesn't make sense because when times were good, they were still cutting us. When times are bad, they're not, they're cutting us. Um, I think the priorities that these elected officials have are misplaced. When the first thing that they want to cut is nutrition programs, transportation, and senior services, and for children and all of that, um, you know, what does that say of, of the values that they have? And that's what our, our membership reminds them of which is why I was saying earlier that there should be, because seniors vote in such great numbers, they have to be out of their minds to try to cut um, senior services and, and programs and benefits. Um, with, the, with the issue of pitting one against the other, uh, one, uh, one thing that we do in both of, you know, in statewide and um, Brooklyn-wide, and the Great Panthers does it also, we never say it's just for the seniors. It's seniors and families. Because, you know, you can't put some, you know, it would be bad to have to put a senior in against a child. Children don't vote. <laughs> so technically, they don't have a way to, to defend themselves. But on the other token, by the other token, um, seniors, grandparents now take care of their grandchildren. And more now, a lot of the children, not even grandchildren, are moving back in with their parents, which happen to be senior citizens. So if the senior is not doing well, the rest of the, the family, and by extension, the rest of the community is not doing well, and vice versa. So we all have to be together on this. Um, the other thing we do is we work with a lot of coalitions that are comprised of the disabled, of the um, seniors and families and children's um, you know, organizations, and we always try to have that united front. 
Um, the battle really isn't an older person against a younger person. Um, you know, they were able to find monies to bail out banks. They were a they're able, you know, all, Wall Street is coming back. The problem is these bonuses, these, the, 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 um, these people are getting, these leaders are getting bonuses and getting more money than before, but guess what? They are being, um, they're, they're being rewarded for cutting jobs, for being, you know, for, for doing things that are not necessarily ethical in our sense, maybe in their, in their, um, you know, friend, you know, their realm of work it is, but it's unethical from a human standpoint. And I think we need to remind elected officials of the values of society and of the people who vote for them. Um, I think we have one challenge, if I could just add on to this. Sure is that um, these new campaign uh, finance laws are really going to affect the people that are, are um, you know, are gonna affect us. Because now uh, these, uh, these corporations are allowed to donate to an elected official's campaign as if they were a person, which means that they could give as much money as they want. Uh, when we're talking about oil companies, when we're talking about pharmaceuticals, or, um, or HMOs or large organizations like that, we cannot compete you know, in terms of financing. And unfortunately, they do, um, they, those policies really do affect you know, and, and sway, sway what type of influence there is in Congress and in the, in, in the different, um, of, yes. Yes, Lillian, the, the whole basis of our uh, democracy is the vote. That's, that's, and the, the founding fathers saw that and tried to protect it. And they, it lasted quite a while. <clears throat> but when the, the new um, corporations started to, uh, in their wings, and they wanted to get into the act <clears throat> because they, so they saw that the vote was the answer to, to, to get the, to get what they want, to get what the the, the society to be one which is for their benefit, and they worked on that, and we weren't fast enough to see what they were doing, and now they got all the way to the Supreme Court when they got this new ridiculous decision that corporations are people. They'll never get rid of, of what's happened now. It got, you know, rolls over and over and over, it gets too big. Now it's very big. And they, they try with little pieces to get some help. But it, the only way it's going to be done is if all the people do not vote for anybody who gets money from big corporations or money to... Who's there left to vote yet? <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll be surprised who'll show up. You'll be surprised who'll show up. There was, there, there was uh, people here and there that say this people in politics that say this. And, and they, they, that's what they're gonna to have to do. And all these little things that they try to do will not help. Will not help. I don't know, I don't know how they're ever gonna settle it, but they have, set, they have to settle it. That, no, that they can't accept big donations, nothing above $250. They'll work it down gradually. Because now they're working, they're not working for us. They're working for the people who pay them. <laughs> and, and it's very obvious, and they don't care if we know. They tried to keep it a secret, didn't work, but then, and now they don't care. They, they got everybody in tow. Yes, there's a few other, yes, you had your hand. Hi, I'd like to say that I'm a proud third generation member of the 
great pastors. Great. Uh -huh. Grandmother, mother, and um, uh, I want to piggyback on what this lady said, uh, wondering what's being done for caregivers, because I have been a caregiver most of my life, and what can we do as the uh, Older Americans Act is coming up for review. I understand there are a lot of inequities, a lot of imbalances, state to state, and what can we do to get involved? No, it's a good question. Anyone want to answer have knowledge about caretakers? <laughs> yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, the uh, the caregivers program. Caregivers. Um, the caregivers program. Uh, I know under the um, the the Older Americans Act in the last uh, since the last twelve years. They have done very little to, to enhance the money that has been giving, given, and they have, but they have uh, made a special concession to two things. One is they, they included the Title III CE, which is the caregivers, um, but then, uh, and also for, they've, they've, uh, they've raised the amount of money for, the, uh, for, for senior workers, and that, those are the only two things that have been enhanced in the Older Americans Act the last 12 years. Um, the, uh, one thing that, that I know in New York State, what they're trying to do is um, have this uh, consumer-directed law, which would help people who are caregivers to actually get paid to, um, to care for the person, if, you know, if, if that's what the family decides. Because a lot of times, I mean, as we know, a person, the best, the, the best care you're going to receive is at home and from the, your loved ones. And I don't have to tell you that because I know you know. <laughs> but um, so now there, there's this push for the consumer-directed law because what's happened is a lot of the women, especially women, but anybody who, who, who is a caregiver, um, ends up sacrificing their productive years where then at the time when they're retiring, they are probably worse off economically than the person they were caring for even because they lose a lot of a lot of uh, income in those productive years mm -hmm. so um, this consumer directed it's law what it does is it at least pays a little bit for that person's efforts in taking care of their relative the but we also have this other um, proposal for you know that we're at, I know that in statewide we're trying to pat to to get a sponsor for it as well um, where uh, we're trying to get, I know a lot of the, the organizations are into it also, um, where we're trying to get people, especially women, who stay home to get some type of credit, tax credit for their social security and, you know, for, in their retirement so that they get credit for having stayed home those years taking care of, you know, their loved ones. Um, so those are two two bills that would be. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's another. This, this is a. This is certainly a, right. a very important current issue. This was a big, uh, at the American Psychological Association meeting. There was a whole series of programs on caregiving. So hopefully, not just that, but I mean, I think it's reaching all over. I mean, and, and you know, hopefully something will be done about it because it seems to be important in, in many different venues. Did you want to have a, did you have a question or comment? Uh, Judy, what I answer? I'm going to uh, take the, the prerogative of the chair and, um, and say, uh, what can we do? Because that's what Great Panthers is. It's an action-oriented organization. We write letters. We, we uh, march. We demonstrate. Sometimes we even get arrested. Okay, 
So the first thing that you can do, vote. Vote on Tuesday. Tuesday is the primary. Vote for, I don't care what candidate, Great Panthers is nonpartisan, but vote in some way for people who believe in the things that you believe in and who will carry out. Tuesday, this vote is like the most important vote. It's your heaviest counting vote that you can ever have because unfortunately, not very many people go to vote in the primary. So your vote will count 10 times more than it would in any other kind of an election. So vote. Please I vote Tuesday. I'm sure you do, Marie. I'm sure you do. And bring your, encourage your friends to vote too. Right. <laughs> and neighbors. Uh, the second thing as far as the corporations who can now give as much money as they want, I think that they should be taxed mm -hmm. the way an individual is taxed. Right. And even if they are 10% of their gross income, right, mm -hmm. then that would be fine. And that will pay for the lot of the social services that we are seeing reduced because of the kind of people that they are electing. So that is an idea, just an idea. Um, the, other, the other thing that I, I do want to say is Great Panthers has three main priorities. Our first is peace on a worldwide basis. And for those of you who are really strong on peace, please, by all means, write, advocate the president and our senators to uh, not only take the 90,000 troops out of Iraq, but the remaining 50,000 and out of Afghanistan. And if you want to do something, Wednesdays from 4.30 to 5.30, the Grandmothers Against the War, march and stand in front of, um, across the street from Saks Fifth Avenue, in front of, uh, what is it, Rockefeller Center, mm -hmm. and they vigil for one whole hour there. So that's something you can do, hold a sign and say you are against the war. Hand out a leaflet. Okay, With the second thing that we work on is the environment. And we are really concerned about the environment. And in the back are all these little postcards. Take a bunch of them. Hand them out to your friends. Right now, here in New York, we are fighting against hydrofracking for gas. Right. And that is uh, in upstate New York. And we do not want that to happen. So take a few of these. and. Write to um, the Speaker of the Assembly, to your senators. Most of our senators here in New York and in Brooklyn are, are very positive towards this. Because what could possibly happen is that our drinking water will become poisoned because of the fracking that will be done. So that is one thing that, is, that you can do. The third issue that we are, are very involved with is health care. Health care for everyone. Single payer meant that we wanted us to be able to be taxed and the government to pay. It's basically Medicare for all. And that's the kind of a thing that we are still going to be fighting for. Okay. Great Panthers, as, as you very kindly said, have been working in coalition. Coalition with, I'm looking around the room and I, I see people from other organizations that we work in coalition with. So, Remus, Remus Jason, would you just make one comment about Presbyterian Senior Services and your wonderful grandparent program? And you've got a program that's coming up at Fordham. So, yes. Um. Well, I'm Remus Chase, I'm uh, the Executive Director of Presbyterian Senior Services, and we've had a long relationship with Great Panthers. Uh, Maggie Kuhn was involved with our organization from way back when, and uh, in, actual, uh, in actuality, we started a uh, Maggie Kuhn Award, 
that we've been giving out for the last 15 years in her honor, uh, given to uh, people who advocate uh, not only on behalf of the elderly, but for a variety, wide variety of causes, people who really work and strive to improve their community. So uh, we have a great partnership with uh, Great Panthers, and Judy must be on a recruitment drive. Or maybe she's meeting her quota. I don't know. But she's recruiting everybody here, uh, but she's recruited uh, me as well to join the Great Panthers, and we enjoy working with her. Uh, you mentioned the intergenerational uh, aspect of what we do. Presbyterian Senior Services offers a wide variety of services. We run senior centers. We have senior apartments. We have also have the first um, apartment built specifically for grandparents raising grandchildren. It was built uh, five years ago. This is our fifth anniversary. It's in the South Bronx in a neighborhood and a community that desperately needs uh, residents like that. And the way we make it successful is because we support the family. We support not only the grandparents, because when people come to the building, they're always asking about those programs. And that's very important. And it's next to one of our senior centers, so we're able to support the grandparents. But equally important, as you all know, you we're talking about intergenerational programs, supporting the children. Kids do well. The family does well. The family's doing well with grandparents. So we uh, support the kids with after school programs, really making that connection for, for them in terms of success in school would mean success on the job, success in life, etc. Uh, so we have the after school programs, we have the summer camp programs, we have vocational programs, etc. And uh, our apartment is uh, widely recognized and was actually the subject of a documentary called Grandmother to Grandmother that features our grandparents as well as their counterparts in Tanzania uh, and shows how much they have in common and uh, follows both those stories. And that's going to be a subject uh, of a presentation at Fordham University, the, the Manhattan campus, on Tuesday, October 5th. And if you want more information, just see me afterwards. Okay. And then we talked already, and Muriel, if you don't mind, I'm not going to call you up with New York Statewide, and that Maria is also involved with. And on um, this Monday, tomorrow at 1 o'clock, please see her for directions as to where to go, because anybody is welcome to those things. Okay, Roger, you weren't here before when I introduced special people. I wanted to say thank you, so could you stand right now? Did you bring the books? No. Okay. Well, you can go on Amazon because I just checked and you can buy one of Roger's books. It's called Great Panthers and um, it's really an excellent, it's a great excellent book. background. Okay. I think that I have done everything. What I want to say. Um, we will have on our website, which is www.greatpanthersnyc.org, all of the calendaring type of things that we are doing. Because, as I said, we work in coalition with so many other groups. We will be October 7th at the United Nations for independence. <laughs> for the International Day of Older Persons, plus at the health fair at uh, at Liz Kruger's uh, Senior Resources at uh, Emmanuel. Temple Emmanuel on Fifth Avenue. When is it? That's the seventh, also in the afternoon. So there are a myriad of activities that are going to be done, and we are going to do a bit more on, um, on uh, the environment, and we're going to reconnect with our Gray and Green Coalition, which was 18 different organizations. And I'm so glad that Ed is here and talked about um, HIV AIDS, and those are the kinds of things that we work on. Lillian, I appreciate the fact that you talked about the Islamic Community Center. Great Panthers is very much for that, very positive for that, because this is our American value. We are based on freedoms, and freedom of religion is certainly one of the freedoms. 
I'm going to just close with, and I apologize, I'm thanking you, Maria. I'm thanking you wonderfully. Benny in the back, thank you very much for being on our panel. But I'm going to close with, what can we do? Uh, times are changing, and I'm not going to make any excuses for that. What we can do is what you can do individually. I wear that Gandhi little necklace. Be the change you wish to see in the world. I don't care what you do, just do it. Thank you. Right, that's a great note on which to close, but I want to also thank the panel who uh, made my job easy. <laughs>